Good morning. Well, if you'll take your Bibles this morning and turn to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. I love the Christmas carols. Amen. I love the Christmas carols. This morning, I, was, I think it was this morning, early this morning, I was thinking about the parade, the parade of lights. Um, I wasn't thinking about the parade of lights per se. I was thinking about something in particular about the parade of lights, and that was Imperial Community Church, our float in the prayer of lights. That's what I was thinking about this morning. And... Uh, what I was thinking about concerning our float in the parade of lights, what, what is what was on the side of the float and what we were representing. That's what I was thinking about. Christ is the reason for Christmas. That's what I was thinking about. I was thinking about Imperial Community Church and... Imperial Community Church being a public witness Friday night. That's what I was thinking about. I felt pretty good about that. I, I, I think it's okay for me to feel good about that. Don't you think it's okay to feel, for me to feel good about that? I hope you felt good about that if you were on the float or if you were sitting along the, the side there along the curb thinking about that or watching us go by. I know Janet was really excited about it. If you were close, if you were on the float, Janet was walking by with Larry. You know how quick... How, quiet Larry is and how dis- demonstrative uh, Janet can be, you know. She was walking along the curb and she, all of a sudden she noticed us. She jumped out into the street and was just going, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Larry went like this. <laughs> it was funny. Don't overdo it. I think that's what he was saying, you know. We have enough attention already on the, for the float. Uh, I thought she was going to jump in with us. And I, I was just thinking about the witness that we were as the church in Imperial here. For over 100 years is what the reading said. And uh, what it, I, I was just really happy that uh, we were able to do that. And they're still letting us do that. Uh, to put Christ out there in the public in a parade I'm sure there were other people who did that as well. I'm sure there were other floats, but I was happy that we were to do that here in this community, right here for over, well over 100 years and are continuing to do that. And then I thought, and I thought about this. I thought about the word witness in Acts 1.8. You shall be my witness when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The word witness in Greek is the word martyr. That's what it means. And the word, the Greek word is martyr. And uh, how we associate the word witness in in a way to, uh, you know, to be a a public, in the public eye, to view what we believe in our faith. And yet the first century church and many people today around the world are living that out in its true uh, meaning. We are not martyrs. We were not being martyred the other night. Uh, Yet there are people who have been martyred for being so bold and... uh, Yet we have not. That is, that's actually a blessing to, to a great degree when you think about it. Although the apostles taught us that it's also a great blessing beyond measure to be a martyr for Christ as well. Here at Appeal Community Church, we are blessed to this point um, to be able to do that freely without martyrdom. Now if you'll notice in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25, this morning, the proclamation of the king. The proclamation of the king. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, husband being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, he planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, 
Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And obviously, Joseph was fearing to take her unto himself because she had been found with child during the betrothal period. He was afraid to take her as his wife. It doesn't mean he didn't want to. It means he was afraid to. A lot of implications were involved in that culture that day if the young woman was found pregnant during the betrothal. So he was afraid. So the angel tells Joseph in a dream, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. He's trying to ease his concern. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary his, as his wife, but he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for corporate worship. Thank you for Impel Community Church. Small in number, great in significance. Small in number, great in witness. Small in number, great in testimony. Small in number and greatly loved by you. Thank you for your word. We know it's not popular. So much preaching today is out of context and tickles the ear. It doesn't penetrate, penetrate the heart. It doesn't make disciples of Christ. So thank you for the word. May we keep it in context. May we preach it in season and out of season. May we be faithful to the Holy Script. Be faithful to the Holy Calling. Be faithful to your Holy Word. And may we rightly divide it as a testimony, as a witness, and someday possibly a martyr for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This passage, although found in Matthew, is a, is a counterpart to what we learned about Mary last week. As you remember, Mary received word from the angel Gabriel. We're familiar with the stories because we, we mention them every year. We preach from these same passages every year during the Christmas season. She received word from the angel Gabriel that she would be pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember that from last week. That the Holy Spirit was going to overshadow her and she'd become pregnant. She would conceive in her womb. That's how the NASB translated that. This morning, this morning's passage comes after that announcement to Mary. So we're kind of looking at this chronologically. Mary got the announcement from Gabriel, and sometime after that, we're not sure exactly when, uh, Mary gets this news to Joseph. And, and Joseph has no doubt been given word by Mary about this divine mission. What is she supposed to do? What is she going to do? What God has called her to do, of which Joseph, no doubt, does not believe. He doesn't believe any of it. Not convinced. I'm sure she told him the story in detail. And he's not convinced. I think maybe he's thinking that maybe Mary's, you know, off her rocker, so to speak. Great claims. An angel of the Lord came to me and spoke to me and told me that I am going to have God's son. So he doesn't believe it. And we don't know at what point Mary told Joseph. All we know is that it was sometime during the betrothal period. Verse 18 makes that clear. We don't know how soon after Mary's encounter with Gabriel that she told Joseph. It could be she waited till after her visit with Elizabeth. The angel told her that her cousin Elizabeth was in her sixth month. She went and visited Elizabeth. So maybe when she came back, and that, was, that gave Joseph even more or greater suspicion. She was away for a while, she comes back, she's pregnant, ha, tells me this crazy idea, this crazy story, whatever. So we don't know how soon after. Uh, we just don't know. All we know is the obvious. It was sometime after her encounter with Gabriel 
that she told Joseph. I want to give you an outline for this morning. Sometimes I give you outlines, sometimes I don't. It just depends on what happens and what formalizes in my study. Sometimes when I look at the passage, there's a alliterated outline laying right on top of the page. Not literally, but it's there. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, it, the Spirit of God reveals it to me and says, hey, check out this cool little outline. That's in today's vernacular, right? And sometimes not. Sometimes we just go through it verse by verse. We always go through it verse by verse, but sometimes there's an outline. So here it is. Number one, if you're taking notes, the plot. The plot, simply the plot, verse 18. Number two, the plan, verse 19. The plan. Number three, and that's, that's, this is the theme of this morning's message, or the title of this morning's message, the proclamation, that's verse 20 and 21. The proclamation. And spell it just like it sounds. Proclamation. And then number four, the promise, verse 22 and 23. And then the last two verses, 24 and 25, the performance. And each one of those um, points, there's five of them, are going to take 30 minutes. When I was in the prison, no one was going anywhere. We had a captive audience. Let's look at them. Number one, the plot, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary, that's Jesus, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now, much of what is in the plot we've already covered last week. So if you weren't here last week, you can listen to it on YouTube. We're not going to go back. But here's what happened. Mary would be found with child by the Holy Spirit and, and that this would, would have taken place during the betrothal period. That's the point we tried to make last week. She was found pregnant by the Holy Spirit, by a supernatural intervention by God, the Spirit of God. She was found pregnant during the betrothal period. What we didn't cover is Matthew's opening words there in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. For a moment, let's consider Matthew's words here. That's what I wanted to do. I don't want to kind of go over what we did last week. That's just going to take more time. But Matthew was a Jewish man writing about a Jewish man, two Jewish men. I'll say it again. Matthew was a Jewish man writing about a Jewish man to Jewish men. And that's revealed in the words that he's chosen to use in chapter 1. Now, the Jews would find um, verse 18, the words that Matthew used to open up with, those words they would find very amazing, especially if, if you were a Jew. Uh, Matthew isn't writing about just any birth. He's not. This is the birth, the most special birth, the most greatest birth, the most awesome birth, the most amazing birth, the birth of God in human form. That's what this is about. And we can see he's writing about the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, by the time this was written, there was already lots of talk about the name Jesus Christ. Everybody in that area, many people already heard about Jesus Christ. By the time Matthew's written this, everyone in Judy, Judea and in Galilee, in that area, even in the Samaritan world, parts of Samaria and the Gentile nations had heard about Jesus Christ, the name Jesus Christ. In fact, here in America, it's like that. Uh, there's very few people that you can run into today, today who have not heard the name Jesus. They may not know what it, what it means or the depth of what, it, what it's all about, but they have, there's hardly very few, I'm sure, here in America that have not heard the word Jesus as much as we're trying to erase it in our culture today. So Matthew wrote, to clear up all that was falsely associated with the name Jesus Christ. There was a lot falsely associated in that day with the name, and there's, it's becoming more increasingly falsely associated today. And um, I'm, I'm sure the other gospel writers did that as well. Now, if you'll notice verse 1 in chapter 1. Take a look. Verse 1 in chapter 1. Matthew tells his readers that he is presenting the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. That's what he's doing. He's presenting the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. And in verse 18, the birth of Jesus Christ. That's exciting. 
those two words are used interchangeably, and basically they speak of the same person. It's the same person. Both Messiah and Christ, they mean the anointed one. That's what it means, Messiah and Christ. Hebrew, Messiah, Greek, Christ, both mean the anointed one. He's covering both sides of the plane here. He's talking to the Jews now, he's talking to Gentiles. We must understand that uh, Matthew's talking about the birth and the, and the genealogy of the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. You guys got that? So he's making it very clear in the first chapter of his gospel that he's writing about the Jewish Savior, because he's a Jewish writing to Jews about a Jew. He's writing about the Jewish Savior, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. That's what he's writing about. This is also why he uses the name Jesus, Yeshua in the Hebrew, meaning the Lord saves. This is great news. This is amazing news. This is exciting news. This was great news to the shepherds. This was great news to the kings of the east. It wasn't so great a news to Herod, but it was great news, good news, great news of great joy. For in the city of David, the Savior has been born for you. Amen? That's a testimony we, we shared with Imperial Community. For you. Great news. Then I saw something terrible the next day. Something terrible. You're probably going to think I'm out of, my, out of my mind. It was terrible. It was saddening. It saddened my heart. Desperately saddened my heart. And I looked at my wife and said, it's really sad. It's really sad. This is great news. Matthew's writing about it. People have lost their lives because of it who believed it and trusted it, who were witnesses of the same truth. My wife and I are driving west on Imperial Avenue in El Centro. No, we're driving south on Imperial Avenue in El Centro. It's hard to drive west on Imperial Avenue in El Centro. And all of a sudden there's these sirens and there's these highway patrols and sheriffs and undercover vehicles and... Lines and lines and lines of them and loud lights and people are pulling over and Harley Davidsons and people just coming down Imperial Avenue heading north and we're driving south and we're pulling over and traffic's moving out of the way and right in the middle of it all there's this SWAT vehicle, it's like a military armored vehicle and on the top of it, Santa Claus. Just waving. And they'll spend all that money and pull all those officers off of duty for a pagan belief. For a pagan belief. That's heartbreaking. Get them to do that for Jesus. That's what Christmas is about, right? What a waste of taxpayers' dollars, in my opinion. So all of what Matthew is saying here, all of what he's saying in chapter 1, most definitely would draw the Jewish reader into the plot. Into the plot. Every Jewish person, they understood these names clearly. And I would venture to say that, that they were household names. Messiah, Anointed One, Now, the identity of the Messiah is given in verse 22 and 23, which we'll get to in short order. So to use the phrase, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows in verse 18. After referring to Jesus as the Messiah and giving his genealogy would most definitely draw his readers into the plot. As I said, what's the plot? That we have a betrothed couple, okay? Remember I told you what betrothal was last year or last week? It wasn't a simple engagement like we have today. You can break an engagement easily. You can just say, I don't love you anymore. I made a mistake. I don't want to do this anymore. And you can walk away from it. Throw the ring back at him and walk away. But not in this. This was actually considered already married, but they weren't living as married couples. You know what I mean by that, right? 
My wife says I get too descriptive sometimes. She gets nervous about it. <laughs> so, you know, you know what I'm saying. She's living over there with her parents. He's got his own place. They're apart from each other. There's, there's a reason for it. There's a lot of biblical reason for it. And it's all on the up and up before God and a betrothed. And if he wants to separate himself from her, he has to divorce her. We'll see that in just a minute. But if you notice, they're being called husband and wife, minus the physical union. You guys got that? I'm not going to get any more descriptive than that. It makes my wife nervous. They're not leaving as husband and wife as yet, and she's, she's apart from Joseph with child. With child. How's that? By the Holy Spirit. We looked at that last week. And because of this, Joseph, her husband, as verse 19 says, what? He planned to send her away secretly. And this is our second point. See, so we're already through number one. It's our second point, the plan, verse 19. Question, why did Joseph plan to put her away secretly? Well, the answer is found in verse 19, right? First of all, the phrase plan to put her away secretly is another way of saying Joseph was planning to divorce her. You may have that in your translation. You may have it translated that way, although that's not how it reads in the Greek. Some translators, you know, they, they beat you to the punch and they give it to you that way, but it really means plan to send her away secretly. That's actual literal translation there. It means he was planning to divorce her, and this gives us the nature of the betrothal bond. It shows us how important an engagement was in those days, so to speak. To break a betrothal required a certificate of divorce. And this had to be done in the presence of witnesses. It also tells us that Joseph didn't believe her story about the angel visit and her conception being of the Holy Spirit. He did not believe that. It's obvious he didn't believe it. It also tells us that divorce was allowable under, certain, under, under the circumstances of infidelity. It tells us that as well. Infidelity which holds true to the scriptures today. Divorce is allowable under the circumstance of infidelity. But Joseph, being a just man, that's the new King James, or, or a righteous man, the NASB, he had in mind to divorce her privately. That's what he'd been thinking about. She told him, he says, that's, that's, that's not easy for any man to believe. How can I believe that? And then as they parted and she went back to where she was at and he went back to his, his carpenter shop, he began to think about it. The more he began to think about it, the more he realizes, I've got to divorce her. I gotta, and I've got to do this privately. I don't want to disgrace her. I don't want to do that. So he's thinking about that, had in mind. Now the exciting thing about the term just or righteous in the context of Joseph means that Joseph was an Old Testament believer. That's what it means. He was genuinely saved. He had a man, he was a man after God's own heart. He was a, man, a God-fearing man. He was a true believer in his heart. Old Testament Christian. That's what he was. He was looking for the promise of the Messiah in his heart. True believer. It doesn't mean that Joseph was fair, was a fair man. It doesn't mean that he was a good man. That's obvious, right? It's obvious. He was a fair man. He was a good man. He was, but he was more than that. He was a genuine believer. That's what that word means. It was a, a, a phrase to describe genuine Old Testament believers in that day. In the Gospel and to Matthew and because of the language of the day, it meant that Joseph was saved. He was a genuinely believing man of God. I just wanted to nail that down because we see the reality of that in his actions and in his heart. Not here, okay, not here, but here where the heart of the motive and the action is bared. Here. And the condition of his heart spiritually shows his actions concerning Mary's presumed infidelity. As far as he knows, she's been unfaithful. She's been playing the field. She got herself in trouble. Now she's trying to excuse herself out of it. She's trying to convince Joseph to keep the marriage, and he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't. 
And there's good reason, right? Now it says in the NSB in verse 19 that because Joseph was a saved man, because he was a righteous man, he didn't want to disgrace her. The New King James says, make her a public example. This is really close to what the original Greek is saying here. Make her a public example. He didn't want to do that. And I think it's because he loved her. I think he genuinely loved her. Now remember, I told you last week that marriages were arranged by parents and sometimes they never even knew the person until the wedding night. And love had nothing to do with it. You would learn to love over the course of five years and ten years and twenty years and thirty years. At twenty-five, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, they sang that song, Do You Love Me? She said, well, after cooking and cleaning and all those things, I guess I do. She learned to love by her personal sacrifices. That's love. But here, there was, that was not considered. There were marriage, arranged marriages by the parents or the matchmakers in the culture. And I know that Joseph and Mary knew each other because they lived in a very small town. But some towns were large and sometimes they didn't meet each other until the night of the wedding. You can imagine how nervous, nervous that would have been for both sides of the party. But he didn't want to make her a public example. This is, speaks well of him. I think it's because he loved her. And Mary's reputation, given that, given that, that phrase, public example, Mary's reputation wasn't the only thing at stake here. According to that phrase, public example, her life was at stake. Not just her reputation. Public example... Disgrace, shame, ESV, all spoke of more than just her reputation and that of her family. It was more than that in that culture. Here's the point. As far as Joseph is concerned, Joseph being a saved man concerning Mary's presumed infidelity, being a righteous man, being a saved man, Joseph was mostly concerned about obeying the word of God. I think this is awesome. He loves Mary. He doesn't want to make her a public example. But he's torn because the Word of God says something about this kind of condition. This kind of circumstance. And he's more concerned about the Word of God. That's what he's concerned about. God's Word. And does he obey the Word of God to the letter? To the letter. So that puts Joseph in a very difficult situation. Why? Because the biblical thing to do at that time, under the law of Moses, was public stoning. That's what it meant. Public stoning. When you see the movie Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Joseph is in the, in the movie Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph is in, in his room and he's asleep and he's, he's dreaming, he's having this dream, and he's dreaming of Mary being chased by, the, by the, the townspeople in Nazareth, and she's being chased, and they've got rocks, and she, she falls down against this building, and they're all ready to throw rocks at her. And that's what he's thinking about, and that's what he's, he's worried about, and that's what he's concerned about. And, and, and he doesn't want to marry an adulteress, and he, he, but he, he doesn't want doesn't to expose her to public shame. He doesn't want to expose her to public execution. And he's confused, and he's troubled and having anxiety I'm sure and doesn't know what to do in the middle of the dream the angel comes and speaks to him this is that dilemma that he has here. He's a, he's a, you, know, you know what most people did in that culture when someone was found pregnant during the betrothal period or even outside the betrothal period they were found pregnant you know what most people would do <laughs> they would stone them without any mercy without any feeling they would, he, Joseph could have felt shame, he could have felt embarrassment, he could have felt ripped off using our terms today. He could have acted like everyone else in his anger. He could have said, how dare her do that to me? Yes, that's stoner, right? Typical, typical reaction. You get hurt, you hurt back, right? Someone do you bad, you do them back, you do them bad back. That's what you do. But he's a just man. He's a righteous man. He's a saved man. He's concerned about what's right and just and proper and what would best glorify God. What would best glorify God? 
Pretty convicting, huh? It is to me. I'm so far away from Joseph's righteousness in the practical sense. Spiritually, I'm right up there with him. Very difficult situation. Public stoning. We saw this to be the case of the adulterous woman in John 8, 11, when Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I had someone throw that in my face a few months ago. They brought me a stone. They accused me of being judgmental. And they said this, that he who was out sin cast the first stone. And what I wanted to say to him, but the Lord told me in my heart, do not cast your pearl amongst the feet of swine. What I wanted to say to him was, you forgot the second half of that because this person was living in sin and they didn't like my judgment, which came from God. Go and sin no more. The Lord said, don't waste your words on him. They were going to publicly stone that woman, if you remember, had Jesus not come to her rescue. Well, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Will you do that and notice verse 23 and 24? Deuteronomy 22, verse 23 and 24. Turn there. You've got to see it for yourself. Serious, serious crime before God. This isn't crimes of men. Men could care less. In fact, divorce was rampant in, that, in this day, in the day of Jesus. We'll see that in a minute, and we'll see that when we get to um, Mark chapter 9. When we get back to Mark, the first thing Jesus talks about is divorce. These people that are leaving, they're not mad at me. They're going to Mexico for a birthday party or something. You know, so. <clears throat> or maybe they might be mad at me. I don't know. They, okay, thanks. Look at what it says there, verse 23. If there is a girl who is a virgin engaged to a man, that speaks of the betrothal period where Joseph and Mary were at. And another man finds her in the city and lies with her. We're not going any farther than that. Then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city and you shall stone them to death. The girl, because she did not cry out in the city. In other words, she didn't bring it to the authorities. She didn't try to say, hey, I don't want to get involved in this kind of thing. And the man, because he has violated his neighbor's wife. Again. She's being referred to as the man's wife while she's still a virgin. Okay, that's the betrothal period. So the betrothal was way more bonding or binding than today's engagements. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. Do you see that phrase there at the end? The evil from among you. The act of sexual relations outside of the bond of marriage, God says, is evil and it needs to be purged. This will corrupt the society. It will corrupt the society and take this society away from God. That's what's happening with the nation of Israel. So this law ha was true. It held true in Joseph's day. And, and I just put a note here. Think of the massive decrease in immorality in our culture today if this was held true. We might be a nation under God again, wouldn't we? We might be parading Jesus down the street instead of Santa Claus, wouldn't we? Because yeah, every major society, every major culture in man's history that fell, fell, started falling because of immorality, which became idolatry. Even Israel. When, Israel, when, when Jesus came to Israel, they were dead spiritually. They were false worshipers of a false god. They were. They weren't even worshiping the god of Israel anymore. The temple was a, was a farce. Temple worship was a farce. It was offensive to God. That's why Jesus went in and cleansed it. Remember, he did it twice. At the beginning of his ministry and the end of his ministry, he went in and turned it upside down because they had made it a house of merchandise, not a house of prayer. Yes, holiness is important to God. Absolute holiness is important to God. Maybe not to his people, but to God. And Joseph, because he was a saved man with a saved man's conviction, he was at an impasse. He was stuck in the middle of it all. Boy, that's a, that's a definitely an issue of anxiety, I'll tell you that much. 
Although it was in him to obey the law of God because he was saved, I want to say that again, although it was in him to obey the law of God because he was saved, because he was saved, he didn't have it in him to put Mary to death. He didn't. Had he not been saved, no problem at all. Kill that filthy woman. That's what he would have thought. Avenge me, my embarrassment. Mercy is a big part of the believer's heart. And so Joseph, being a righteous man, a saved man, didn't want to make her a public example. He planned to put her away, or he planned to divorce her in a private divorce proceeding. That too was part of the law of Moses, but it had been messed up. Let's go look there. Deuteronomy 24. That had become part of the law of Moses as well, but it wasn't being interpreted correctly by the time Jesus came along. I guess we could read all of it. I'll just read, just read verse 1. You can read the rest of it for yourself. But it says in Deuteronomy 24, 1, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds, that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found her with some indecency. Okay, that's indecency. The New King James, or the King James would be uncleanness. He's found her with some indecency in her. He writes her a certificate of divorcement. He puts it in her hand and he sends her out up from the house. And then it goes on to des- describe a little bit more of that. But in reality, these verses weren't really condoning divorce. They were not condoning divorce at all. At all. The word indecency or clean, uncleanness was, was a general term and it meant anything other than divorce. Was it talking about divorce? Or it would have said it. It's talking about getting a, getting a divorce for something other than infidelity. That's what it's talking about. Something other than infidelity. Indecency. Uh, I don't know. What do we call indecent today? Nothing. Right? Nothing's indecent anymore in today's world. I don't know. Maybe she, maybe, you know, it was a known fact that in the, in the Greek world in the first century, uh, women's lib was very big, and women wanted to dress like men. Women wanted to be just like men in every way. So a lot of times there was a group of women that were running around in the streets of Corinth and other places without their tops, bearing, uh, bearing swords and grunting and spitting like men. I would call that a, a lewd or indecent act. But that's not indecent anymore. It's really not. But if you, if, if, for a wife, you found some indecency in your wife, other than infidelity, they were trying to say that you could perform a divorce. That's what they say. The passage shows that divorce is being allowed but not condoned by God. That's what it's talking about. I'm talking about divorce for any reason other than infidelity. So, and you can look at this for yourself. Okay, You can read it. It's there for yourself if you want to read it. And we have it. We have it. Confirmed from Jesus in Matthew 19. Verses 1 through 4 actually show that unbiblical divorce causes adultery. So think of America and how many people divorce on unbiblical terms because they found some kind of indecency amongst one another. Think how easy divorce comes in today's society. Think about it. What does it do? It causes adultery. It's plain, it's, plain, it ex, it's explained there in that passage. And I didn't mean to camp there, but it's just such a serious issue in today's world, and it was a serious issue in Moses' day, and it was a serious issue in, in uh, Jesus' day, and it just corrupts society. If I divorced my spouse for anything other than infidelity and she wouldn't remarry, I would cause her to commit adultery. That's, that's what the passage is saying. You look at it for yourself. In the mind of Joseph, though, Mary was unfaithful, thus divorce was acceptable. It was. So rather than publicly disgrace her and have her stoned and put to death, he would legally divorce her. Like they say here, write a certificate of divorce. According to this verse, he would write her a certificate of divorce and he would send her away privately. And this takes us to our third point this morning, and that is the proclamation, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 and 21.
Here's where it gets all straightened out. I just wanted you to see the drama that was what was in Matthew or what was in Joseph's mind. You know, we, we read through these passages and we sing about them at Christmas time, and, and we just go, we just so quickly go through them, and we never really know what was really going on in the heart and the mind of the people concerning the birth of Christ. And what was involved with it all. There were real people with real issues and difficult, dramatic, painful, hurtful truths about Jesus coming into the world. And Christmas to us is how many presents I have under the tree and what do I got in the stocking? Right? Is that true or is that just me? But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She'll bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Look at this. He will save his people from their sins. Now that's worth shame and embarrassment. That's worth protecting. Now, a lot could be said about these verses, but what's most important this morning is the proclamation that the angel gave to Joseph concerning the child in Mary's womb. But let me say something that is pertinent to the passage. Not so much pertinent to the proclamation per se, but let me say something that is pertinent to the passage. And that is about the angel speaking to Joseph in a dream. This is very important. It's not part of the proclamation at all. He talks to him in a dream. We don't know why a dream. Why not a personal visit like Mary? Mary got a personal visit, right? He gets a dream. Kind of de-emphasizes his importance, right? Mary gets a personal visit from an angel. He gets a, a visit from an angel in a dream. You know, maybe maybe that was where his that, maybe that's where he was at. You know, I get a lot of dreams, but I don't I don't make life decisions on dreams. If I did, man, I phew, I have some pretty bizarre dreams. It could be that, that a mission of such magnitude as the birth, as giving birth to the Son of God warrants a personal visit from a heavenly host. Wouldn't you agree? We don't get personal visits from heavenly hosts because our lives will not be as significant as Mary's and Joseph's and Zachariah's, will it? We're not giving birth to the Son of God. Uh, we're not cousins to the one who's giving birth to the Son of God. My cousin isn't giving birth to John the Baptist. For those people out there that say they get visits from the angels, and there's a lot of people out there that say they get visits from angels. Don't believe it. It doesn't happen to just any old person. Zacharias received news of his wife Elizabeth in Luke 1. She was beyond bearing children, way beyond bearing children, but she was going to give birth to John the Baptist. That's important, right? That's major. That's, that's a huge in magnitude. That warrants an angelic news bearer, messenger, chronicle, chronicler. Both were huge events concerning the coming of the Son of God, God with us. Joseph received his news in a slightly different way. Joseph was spoken to by an angel in a dream. Just like angel visits, dreams of divine nature are very rare. Very rare. And there's only been a handful recorded in Scripture. Only a handful. Not too many. And each one had great significance attached to it. That would affect a nation. It would affect a mankind. It would affect Earth's history. You get what I'm saying? People, are all, people aren't talking about angel visits and this and that, right? I had some guy tell me one time that he saw the face of Jesus. I was like, you're out of your mind. In fact, he reached out and touched him in his face. The last person in the Bible who saw Jesus' face fell on the ground as though he were dead. He didn't reach out and touch him. When Isaiah saw God in his holy throne, he fell down. Woe is me! Woe is me! For I am undone. He couldn't bear the sight of God because of his sin. Before he could even preach, God had to cleanse his mouth with a coal 
It was so hot, the angel had to use tongs to cleanse his mouth. You say, why are you making such a big deal out of this, Pastor? Because this kind of stuff runs rampant in today's world. All kinds of wild claims. Yes. All kinds. Each one had great significance attached to it that would affect a nation or mankind as a whole. In other words, whenever God was about to do something monumental on earth, he would sometimes bring that message to earth by an angelic vision or a dream. An angelic visit or a dream. We also need to know that those who received a visit or a dream were usually directly involved with what God was planning to do. Like Mary. What was she going to do? Give birth to the Son of God. What was Joseph going to do? Foster parent him. What was Elizabeth and Zechariah going to do? Give birth to John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. Elijah. So, in the case of Joseph, the dream served as confirmation of what Mary had already told him. And this is how we know that, that Joseph's dream was divine in nature. How can you tell when it's divine in nature? Because it jives with Scripture. It jives with what God has already said. God had already given that same news to Mary. Now he's given it to Joseph. Jives. That's called context. Checking it out in Scripture, right? Anytime I have a weird experience, I always go to the Scripture to find out. Man, let's see. Before I go run telling everybody that I touched the face of Jesus, I want to make sure that I'm right biblically. Amen? I don't want somebody to think I'm a hairy tick. Or is that a heretic? Right. Now, what about the angel's proclamation? Well, it sounds a lot like what he said to Mary. The conception was of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's a God thing. And we learned last week just what that meant by or of the Holy Spirit. Then in a very considerate and honoring way, the angel includes Joseph, right? I think that was really awesome. He includes him in the whole plan, saying that he'd, he would give him the name Jesus. So Joseph had the high honor of giving Jesus his name. Not only is he referring to Joseph as the son of David, aligning him with the royal line of the king of King David, him and Jesus both, a noble gesture on the angel's part, linking both Jesus and Joseph to the line of David. But he gives him a privileged task, a privileged task. He wasn't being left out in this great plan of God's, but he's very much included. And he's giving the child's name, okay? He's giving the child's name, which a father's, it's a father's privilege task to give the child the name. The best was saved for last. Notice, and this is what I want to end with. We have two more points, but we're not going to get to them. We're running out of time. Notice the end of verse 21. This is the best part. This is the proclamation. This is what Christmas is all about. It's not parading Santa Claus down Imperial Avenue with all the law enforcement workers. It's this. He will save his people from their sins. This life is temporary. It's temporary. What about your sins? What about eternity? Where are you going to go when you die? That's why we should be jumping up and down at Christmas time. Have you ever stopped to notice the possessive pronoun his there? Have you ever noticed that? That's a possessive pronoun. His people from their sins. This is particular. This isn't all people. This is his people. He came to save his people from their sins. He's not going to save those people from those sins. He's going to save his people from their sins. You ever notice that? That has always puzzled me. You ever wondered why it's stated that way? If you've ever noticed it, have you ever wondered why it's stated that way? He'll save his people from their sins. And this is one of those occasions when all the major translations translate it the same way. There's no dispute in how, it should be, how this should be translated. Every major translation, I've checked it out, they all say the same thing. His people from their sins, they didn't want to get this wrong. Some people say that it's a reference to 
the Jewish people, thus his people, the Jewish people. But we know that can't be true, right? That can't be true because we're wasting our time if that's true. We might as well go home and watch the football game. Football still on? It's just getting started? Or is it at the end? They won the other day, though, right? I don't know. Peter implies in a dream. Peter, Peter, Jesus speaks to Peter in a dream. Jesus implies to Peter in a dream to take the good news to the Gentiles, another monumental event, right? Peter gets a dream from God because it was monumental. Not just the Jews. Go to the Gentiles, And Paul was specifically commissioned to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So this, this wasn't a reference to the Jewish people in particular. Saving his people from their sins must mean something else. One thing it means is that it, as, as his name means, Jesus Savior, he'll, it, um, will mean the means of, it means that he is the means of salvation. That's one thing that it means. Is he'll save his people from their sins. In other words, Jesus is salvation. As Simon said in the temple, he said, For my eyes have seen your salvation. So that's one thing it definitely means. But there's more to the phrase. He literally himself will save his people from their sins. Well, there's two verses I want you to check out, and then we'll close. Two verses in Acts 13. That's going to help us understand the angel's proclamation concerning Jesus saving his people from their sins. Let's go there. Acts 13, 38 and 39. Now this is important to you. Why? Because it was important to God to have it recorded. That's why. Do you see, do you see what happens in most churches? Pastors don't take the time to give you the scripture. They give you the introduction, the body, and the, and, the, and the closing in 15 to 20 minutes. But they spend 40 minutes singing. That's what's happening in today's churches. The sermons are short and topical. They're not expositional. Exposition takes time. Right? Right? So does the study. Don't you want a pastor that, that'll, that'll do his diligence in the scriptures and his study? Don't you want that? No. Verse 38, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things. That's sin. And everything else that goes along with the fall. For which you could not be freed from the law of Moses. So you see, everyone who, who believes are his people. Everyone who believes. That's a distinction, right? Everyone who believes. Consequently, those who don't believe are not his people. Right? So, everyone who believes are his people, and consequently, because they believe in him, their sins are forgiven. The truth is, not everyone's sins are forgiven. Even though Jesus' blood has power to forgive everyone's sins, only his own will he forgive their sins. And who are his own? Well, look, everyone who believes, right? Now we can actually take everyone who believes a step further and define it even more. Let's go down the page there. Go down the chapter. Go down the page. Go down the chapter. Take a look. Verse 44, 40, 44 through 48. Take a look. We get a, an even deeper explanation. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul. Why? Because Paul was preaching the word of God. They were contradicting that, and they were blaspheming. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiated it, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, this is happening in America today, even in churches. We're turning to the Gentiles. 
For so the Lord commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. So it can't be just the Jewish people because we get a biblical reference here. But when the Gentiles heard this, look, the Jews were angry. They were blaspheming. They, they rejected the word of God. And when the Gentiles heard that the, that the word of God was going to the Gentiles now, so they began to what? They began to rejoice and glorify God. The word of God, the word of the Lord. They began to glorify him. And as many as has been what? Appointed to eternal life, what? Believed. Isn't that amazing? So who are everyone who believes in verse 39? Who are his people? Those who have been appointed to believe. Those are the ones Jesus died for. Those are the ones that he came to save them from their sins. Those who were appointed to believe. And who are the appointed ones? Verse 48. Well, the scripture calls them the elect. The scripture calls them the chosen. The scripture calls them the predestined ones. And here they're called the appointed, those who believe that... Those who believe that have been appointed to believe are those in... are the ones in Matthew 121 that the angel says Jesus saves them from their sins. The appointed to believe are his people. And that's why it's in a possessive pronoun. His. We're his people. Those who believe. Because he has appointed us to believe. And this is the angelic proclamation. Listen, people. Listen. You know there's only what? 50 of you here today? Listen. Those who believe, those who have been appointed... Don't parade Santa Claus down the street. Paul said that he bared the marks on his body, the marks of the gospel, right? He bared the marks of the gospel in his body. What else can we say? What else can we say? This is Christmas. That's what it's all about. He shall save his people from their sins. Who are his people? Those whom he has appointed to believe. Those are his people. That's Christmas. That's something to rejoice about. That's something to parade on a float. Right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the depth of your word. Thank you for the presence of your spirit. So many today, Lord, mixing paganism with truth. Mixing paganism with Jesus. So much false religion in the world today, in this country today. In fact, the world is plagued with false religion even in the circle of Christianity. As a nation, forgive us. As a people, forgive us. As a community, forgive us. And as a person, forgive us. May we remember this Christmas season. And we're going to see what the shepherds did with the information next week, Lord. The revelation of the King. We'll see what the shepherds did with the information. Joseph obeyed every word you said. He obeyed every word. May our lives be characteristic of genuine believers characterized by obedience to your word. Forget about those touchy-feely kind of preachers that make us feel good about ourselves. We need to be feeling good about you. The only way to do that is to live righteous lives before you. May our lives be an offering this Christmas to the holiness and greatness of the Son of God, the King of the universe, who came to save his people from their sins. In Christ's name, amen. Let's all stand. Take a hymnal. We're going to close. David, you're right. I'm not sure if I know this one.
292. If you know it, sing it with me so I'm not singing a solo. Thou didst lead thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to her me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room. Amen. Oh, there's Lord Jesus, there's room in my heart. Okay, so let's consider what we're singing, okay? Because the guy who wrote this took very much time and study in the Word of God to put it out to us. Amen? Verse 2. Heaven's arches rang, the angels sang, proclaiming the royal decree. But of lowly birth did this come to earth, and in great humility. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there's room in my heart. The foxes found birds their nest in the shade of the forest tree. But thy couch was the sod, O oh, the Son of God, in the Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there's room in my heart. There came is the Lord with the living word that should people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. Oh, come to my heart. When the heavens shall ring and the angels sing at thy coming to victory, let thy voice call me home, saying, Yet there is room, there is room at my side for thee. May my heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus. That is awesome. That's got some awesome theology in it. Amen. Adam, would you come up and lead us in a word of prayer? And then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your written word. And we just ask that by your power, um, Holy Spirit, we ask you that you would help us to uh, live it out and that this Christmas that we would remember that uh, this time you are the reason uh, for this season that we celebrate your birth. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.